Well, thank you guys for uh, tuning in to the uh, 48-hour broadcast of Preaching Through the Bible. <laughs> the Trinity Broadcasting Network right here in, in Lakeland, Florida. But I am, I am the last speaker of the night, and I'm actually the last speaker of this class uh, for, for this eight weeks, so hopefully I don't mess this up too bad. But uh, go ahead and open up to uh, the book of, uh, maybe I want to guess, Colossians, that's great. I'm going to uh, read, read the passage to get us going. So it's Colossians chapter 4, very last chapter, starting in verse 12, six verses, all the way to 18. And I'm going to try my best to enunciate these names. I actually looked up some of their pronunciations online, so if they sound a little weird, I'm sorry, my redneck and me from South Georgia is trying my best. So uh, verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Herapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And after this letter, once it's been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, and grace be with you. I want to kind of start to my, my sermon off with a question, and that is, have you ever met someone who was more concerned with their job title than they were actually doing their job? Okay. When I think of all the people that you know, I could use as an illustration, I, I just couldn't get past uh, this character. His name is Dwight Schrute. Okay? <laughs> now, uh, it sounds like some of you guys are familiar with Dwight, Dwight Schrute, and if, you, if you're not, it's okay because he actually doesn't exist. Uh, he's a character on a really famous TV show called The Office. So it's, it's pretty, pretty popular show. It's been around for, I guess, the last decade. They're all on Netflix, so I encourage you to go check it out sometime. But Dwight Schrute, he's this character, and he's, he's one of these oddball characters, and he is always so concerned about his job title. So he would say that his title is Assistant Regional Manager. Okay, the problem is, no one else in the office really credits him with that. They refer to him as the assistant to the regional manager. Okay, there's, there's a big difference there. So he, again, he thinks he's the assistant regional manager. His dream is to one day be the regional manager, but behind his back and even to his face sometimes, people say, uh, you're actually the assistant to the regional manager, which is obviously quite different. And as you watch the show, uh, the jokes between uh, Dwight and his frenemy, if you will, his friend and his enemy, Jim in the office, Jim's always giving, giving him a hard time about being the assistant rather than actually the assistant regional manager. Uh, but as I kind of watched the show and I kind of observed why, he, he's always so concerned about his job title that very often he gets distracted from his work, he gets discouraged, and he also, um, he's even belittled from time to time among his peers. And as I think about um, how does this relate to the modern day church, how does this relate to, especially with Paul is in, in, the, in the book of Colossians, and Paul, he, he begins to describe several different key players. So it almost felt like Pastor Connie was like was reading off my notes, talking about some of these different people. But the key players in the story of the early church. But what's interesting is that when Paul is describing these people, he doesn't really give them titles. Okay, so he, he doesn't say you know the lead evangelist of Hathras is delivering the letter to you, and make sure you seek out our small group coordinator, Nympha, and go to the church at her house. He doesn't assign titles, but what he instead is he, he describes different aspects of their character. So if, if Pastor Connie would allow me to borrow a few verses from her passage, I kind of want to go all the way back very briefly to verse 7 and go all the way to verse 17. So in verse 7, Colossians chapter 4, somebody feel free to shout it out. Who is Paul? What name is Paul mentioned? The Tychicus, or Tychicus, I don't know how to say his name. So, so look in verse 7. What words does Paul use to describe this character? Say it out loud. It's okay. Love it. Faithful servant. Yeah. Faithful servant. Somebody else. Dear brother. Dear brother. What else? Fellow servant. Fellow servant. He's faithful. He's beloved. He's a servant. Okay, moving on. Uh, next verse, verse 9. Who, does he, who is he talking about? Onesimus. Onesimus. What words did he describe, uh, used to describe him? Faithful, beloved, Faithful, beloved, okay? Next verse, verse 10. Who is he talking about? Aristarchus. Aristarchus. What, what word is, what, does he describe to, for him? 
He's, he's, a, he's a fellow prisoner. Fellow prisoner. In other words, he's suffering with Paul. Okay. Uh, verse 10, who does he mention? What does he say about him? Not much. Okay. So, so if, you, if you were to flip to some of the other letters of Paul, some of these same people are mentioned. Most of them, these words are, are in Colossians, but for Mark, uh, actually in 2 Timothy, he, he's mentioned that he's useful in ministry. Verse 11, justice, he's also mentioned very briefly in Acts. <laughs> As a worshiper, but then when you come back to verse 12, uh, which is where my passage begins, we hear about Epaphras, and what word is used to describe him? Verse 12. Servant. Servant, okay. Verse 14, Luke, he's beloved. Nympho, what we know about her is she's a host of a church. And then uh, and Archippus, or Archippus, uh, he's described in Philemon as a minister or a fellow soldier. The point I'm trying to make is these people that Paul's talking about, they were known for their character and not for their title, okay? I purposely didn't title my sermon tonight. I don't know if you picked up on it. Why? Because you could be effective and not have a title, wow. all right? I don't know about you guys, but I want to be more concerned about the character of my heart than the title on my business card. I've heard it said before, and I, I looked up online. I, some people attributed this to Harry Truman, former president. Uh, a couple of people said this was came from uh, John Wooden, who was a legendary basketball coach. But the quote is, it's amazing how much can be accomplished when no one is concerned about getting the credit. And I have found this to be especially true in, in church settings. It's crazy, like when, especially after service, I used to, I, I would never look forward to this, but it would be like a big event. This actually just happened this past weekend at a big church event I went to. And when the conference is done, the service is done, the pastor gets up there and says, hey, you guys, we got to shampoo the floors. If everybody can pick up a chair, you know, and stack them in stacks of seven, because that's, you know, that's the holy number, right? <laughs> and so, but it's, it's amazing how quickly we can get these chairs stacked when everyone's working together and nobody really cares about who's getting the credit. Some of the best teams, sports teams and just teams in general that have ever existed, they've been made up of unknown individuals that cared way more about making a difference than making a name for themselves. But if you're anything like me, I've often struggled uh, with, with spiritual pride. Now, I love what Shaq was talking about earlier, how sometimes we can confuse spirituality and we can confuse spiritual disciplines for thinking that we're better than other people or that we're holier than thou or that we, we deserve this title. But in order for us to avoid being spiritually prideful, and in order for us to avoid thinking we're better than other people, in order for us to avoid this thinking that we must have a title to make a difference, uh, and this is like the, the main idea as we're continuing this thread, our identity must be centered on Christ in order to make an eternal difference. Yeah, you can make you can make a difference maybe in your church. You might preach a good sermon from time to time. Even the worst preachers have good sermons from time to time. But if you want to make an eternal difference, your identity must be centered on Christ. And uh, as I was thinking about um, an illustration, and I thought there was a dry erase marker up here. Oh, my God. You have one. This is perfect. I'm so glad that you did that. I meant to check the plug out here. You can literally just throw it at me. Blue is great. Okay. Yes, perfect. So as I thought about uh, what, is, what does it mean to be centered on Christ, I, I thought back to like my middle school days. Okay. So did you guys ever have to do a science for a project? Yes. Wasn't that like the devil? Yeah. Seriously, it wasn't. You had like all semester two or all, you know, nine weeks to prepare for it. And of course you like the morning of, like you wake up at 5 a.m. and you're like, I have a science for a project to do today. And you have no idea what to do. And so you just like go scoop out a cup of dirt from outside. You're like, this is it. Cup of, cup of dirt. <laughs> you know, life comes from the dirt. But I remember when I, when I did a science for a project one year, I had to do like the solar system. Okay, you guys ever had one of those? It's like styrofoam balls and like clothes hangers and stuff. You can get the fancy kind from Michael's, but my mom, I guess, was too frugal for that. And so I always had to like make my own and like paper mache and clothes hangers and it looked really, really bad. But to kind of show you um, how one of, these, one of these things is set up. So you essentially, you have the sun, okay? Bear with me, I know. I didn't major in art, I majored in theology. So you essentially have the sun and it's dead center. And then you have four planets that kind of, you know, they kind of get bigger as, as you kind of go around, you know, I'm sure I'm not trying. And then there's like an asteroid belt like all over here. And then there's a, there's like five more planets, okay? And actually this one's pretty big. There's like five more planets. Uh, if you include Pluto, which I think we should, because you know what? I love Pluto. <laughs> Most of you know, but we're gonna throw them in there anyway. 
So when you uh, when you look at this, what's what's essential? It looks like a football play, doesn't it? Sorry, just imagination. Just go with me, okay? So you got Earth, you got these planets, the asteroid belt, and you have all these other planets. But the thing that makes our solar system work is that everything is centered around one thing, which is what? Sun. It's the sun. Okay. So the sun is what provides light to Earth. It not only provides light, but because of that light, it causes our plants to grow, which produces oxygen for us. Okay. But because of this sun, uh, literally, this is how we tell our time. Okay. So how, how long does it take for the Earth to complete one rotation all the way around the sun? How long does it take? Somebody. Not quite. 365 days. 365 days. Yeah, I know. It's the other one. So as the Earth rotates, it takes one time to spin around. It's 24 hours. But then as it's spinning, it's going around the Earth, and it takes 365 days. So we literally tell our time from how the Earth is centered around the sun. So if the sun tomorrow ceased to exist and it completely went away, what would happen? First of all, we'd, we'd probably freeze to death, okay, eventually, because we, we had no uh, warmth. But also, it would completely throw our timing off, okay? Everything would just be completely messed up because there wouldn't be days and nights. Uh, we, would be, uh, we would have no, no sense of timing. And then also, because of the gravitational pull that the sun has on the Earth, okay, because of that, we would literally go off track and probably drift off into the solar system. So if I'm boring you with science, this is how it all ties in together. Okay, just like the Earth uh, is centered around the sun, and just like we rely on the sun being our center to make everything happen, our timing right, uh, this is where we get our life from, it's where every, every, everything that we have on Earth that we enjoy is a result of the sun's influence on Earth. And it's the same way. When your life is centered around Christ, uh, the timing comes together, you stay on track, and he is ultimately the source of our life. In order for you to avoid being spiritually prideful, you must have Christ as a center. I wrote a couple statements down uh, that kind of ties into this not having a title still making a difference. I said, uh, it's better to be well-respected than to be well-known. Your success isn't based on your level of influence, but instead what you do with the influence that you've been given. And so as we kind of wrap up tonight, uh, I, I want us just to take a few moments and I, I'm not going to drag it out, but I want I want you to ask yourself, if your pastor or leader of your ministry was describing you, would he describe you in the same way that Paul described his followers? Again, he didn't give them a title, but he instead gave them a really positive, almost a compliment to every single one of them. This person's beloved. This person's a servant. This person is a fellow minister. This person's a, a fellow soldier with me. Ask yourself, are you useful in ministry like Mark, or are you a pain in your pastor's side? Are you complaining about how cold it is in the church? Okay, Maybe you don't actually write him an email, but you think it. Okay, I think it every Sunday. All right, I should. I'm either too hot or too cold. But are you useful in ministry? This one's really good, and I know I always make fun of my mom, but if my mom was here, this, this point is for her. When it's your turn to work the nursery, are you faithful or are you flaky? Okay, that's what I wrote down. But kind of in closing tonight, uh, the, point I, the point I'm trying to make with you guys is each and every one of us, we're going to end up serving in a different ministry context. And some of us are going to have titles and some of us aren't. But at the end of the day, you don't need a title to make a difference. You look at all these people uh, in the passage, and I'll kind of read through them real quick again. You've got uh, Tychicus, Anisimus, uh, Aristehas, Mark, Justice, Epaphras, Luke, Nympha, our hate us. We don't really know a, a lot about these people as compared to like the disciples and Paul. But without these people, the early church would have never taken off. And I know Paul. Paul gets a lot of credit, and deservedly so. But when Paul was in jail, these were the difference makers. These were the lay people in the church that were actually moving the church forward. And so I just want to encourage you tonight. You may not ever have a title in ministry. You may always be a volunteer, and that's okay because God, so, because God can still use you in a big way. So thanks, guys. Great job, Stephen.